Ready phases, load four torpedo bays. Engage. From Los Angeles and Nashville, get ready to go behind the scenes with Entertainment Dudes. What happens when you pair a director, Cut. a voice actor, in a world, and some of the most interesting people in entertainment? You're about to find out. Take it away, Cam. Guess what time it is, Jason? My favorite time of the week. It where is. I get to see your face. Why is it only once a week I get to see you? Look at how that stretched. Jeez, that's wow. incredible no, material. You know, is that this, way you, thing, you've this been has probably been out washed about 20 times already. Are you serious? And it yes, still looks I'm that serious. good? And it still looks this good. Merch.entertainmentdudes.com if you want to grab your Entertainment Dudes merch. Uh, Everything that we make on there, we're going to pretty much roll back into the show to bring more incredible content for all of you wonderful listeners and and viewers. They can stretch. So no matter how much Cam works out, his shirt will still fit him. (laughs) As his chest expands. You got got to fill the screen. Yeah. Or if you got a lot of chest hair, it can also sit very nicely on the hair. So Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's nice and soft, too. You got a big bush. So today, uh, something popped up on on the internet that was just um, amazing, and What's it was uh, a, a, a VFX artist um, actually did a next generation Star Trek: The Next Generation scene in the style of the original series filmation cartoon. The cartoons. I, I was looking at this thing and I'm like, this this is spot on. It doesn't even look like a copy. It looks like it was filmation cartoons. The thing, the thing ended up going viral, and we have that guy on the show today. Isn't that Justin Just, G. Lee? Yes. 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 And uh, you want me to bring him in, don't you? Please, we have to do it unceremoniously while okay. I'm talking in the middle of the There we go. <laughs> okay, there we <laughs> go. Oh my God. And I guess I was even ready. There's like the just stuff everywhere. And oh, geez. Yes. You, you guys have such nice backgrounds. Like, oh, thank you. You know, like you, you've what? got like your <laughs> I, Jason, I love your background. You got these did, like accents. Did you see uh, Arcane yet? Have you seen Arcane? No, no. Oh no. my gosh. Oh God, you don't see it. Animation. Please watch Arcane. Yeah, 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 so that's yeah. on Netflix, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. This is part of the thing. My wife had seen one of the characters down there. And she saw the space that she's in. So she recreated the entire space. We've got lights that were running. Oh, she's that's got cool. all kinds. This that's is a black cool. there's black light stuff up top. And oh and wow. She's not done yet, but the whole thing is, is this girl's workshop in the animation that she brought. She that cosplayed is super our cool. wall. That our is super cool. Well. <laughs> that is super cool. There is so much awesome content still. Like I'm catching up on yeah, everyone's yeah. always catching up catching up on everything but that's super cool it's super cool. i think it's one of my favorite animations of all time the wow. storytelling in that is just it's it's literally unbelievable like it's mm-hmm. literally mind-blowing every single frame in that series is a work of art just click frame by frame by frame Ooh. and you you will literally blow be blown away yeah. it's incredible i don't know yeah. they didn't sponsor this show <laughs> <laughs> netflix is a sponsor no, no that's right <laughs> so but so. we're not here to talk about netflix we're here to no. talk about you. <laughs> yes, and and you know, starting off with the this uh, next generation, which is how I how I found you, and I mean, I was just sitting there in awe, the attention to to detail, and I mean, like it it wasn't a it wasn't a parody, it was like the real thing. Um, well, thank you, and I think the, the the thing that's most exciting about this, a, I didn't expect anyone was gonna like maybe 10 people, 20 people. I didn't think it was going to really spread throughout the internet like that. Right. And B, I mean. You do know I, Star Trek fans, right? I, yes. And I, and, I, and I am, I am one of them. Okay, I am, I I'm like, definitely one well of them. Right. I'm definitely one of them, but I think it was, it, so it's been, this is an idea that I've had for, for, I want to say months, if not years. And um, I've been telling people the really geeky thing that my wife and I have been doing, and it's taking us years as we are watching Star Trek by star date, starting from the, Sh- the Shatner <laughs> yes. show. So we saw the original yes. Star Trek and we're very slowly. So now we're in um, Deep Space Nine Voyager. That's where we are. And it's right. taking oh, wow. us like I-, I think we've been doing this for because like we don't watch TV every day. So it's like whenever we have time and we're not watching something else, we'll watch the next star date of Star Trek. So we saw the animated series as part of that pantheon. And there was something just really endearing about it and you know as as i've been saying it's like you can watch it totally straight because that's how they made it they made it in earnest that wasn't supposed to be funny or you can watch it from the outside and go this is a really funny looking 
filmation, you know, like the way it's done, the even the voice acting, you know, I think there's a story that like William Shatner recorded some episodes in a hotel room or something separate from the cast. And it kind of sounds like he's whispering sometimes. So it's got all of these kind of weird things about it. But then I started to think, honestly, what would you what would happen if you took that style? Because we've now seen what the original Star Trek would look like right. as a Saturday morning cartoon, because that's what that show is. But what if you took something like Star Trek The Next Generation and did it that way, what would that look like? What would that sound like? And um, and I kept saying this to my wife and she was like, you know, you really should do this. Um, and I thought it's just, you know, sometimes just doing something for fun. You know, we all do mm -hmm. this. Like we, we have work and we have bills to pay and we got to like, you know, make money. And you just think that's too, that's too much work for something just for fun. But then... I started working on it. Like um, my wife, Lindsay, who, who runs our, our company with me, she went out on a business trip to the UK. So she's gone. And I, um, I kind of made this slightly as a birthday present for her because it was her birthday and she just really, really wanted to see this thing. I started by taking the, um, the music from the animated series, the Ray Ellis music, that jazzy 70s music. And I stuck that under that scene of Captain Picard getting abducted. And I just sent that to her and she was like, you have to do it. You just have to do this. Like, you, you, there's no way you can't do this now, you know? And then I started just one bit at a time doing like the, the opening title screen where I painted the Enterprise D instead of where the original Enterprise was and changed the title. Right. To, you know, and I sent that to her and she, she was like, she was just like, you just have to keep going. Like, I want to see what this is going to look like. So, um, so I did. And you just turn, you know, those are one of those things where it was like, I, I don't see how this could possibly, you know, be anything useful or whatever to do, but I just kept doing it. And then Cam, do we happen you know, to have we, that? We do, but I, oh. what I wanted to do actually was mm. was circle back to that a little bit later mm. and and talk about what got you yes. to this point mm -hmm. just in your career and, you know, getting individual effects and stuff. And then we can maybe run it and then you can tell us some specifics. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, about the show. So, I mean, I mean, going, going back, like when, when did you figure out that you wanted to be in, in visual effects and puppetry and all this stuff? Uh, I've been doing that stuff since I was a kid and I'm guessing yeah. similar to probably you guys and a lot of other people, um, you know, you see certain things when you're growing up and they kind of like really, stick with you and inspire you and make your brain explode little yeah. kid brain go oh my god you know and i've and you know i i think that's the first time i met cam that's how i felt right <laughs> you were just yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you, like so you had those moments more than once but like yeah so definitely right. when when i'm sure when you guys were kids like that's why you're you're in film and you're in the industry and like that's kind of what happens you see this thing and how you can take something that's nothing and turn it into a story and yes. have people be moved by it or laugh or whatever or just be enthralled by it so obviously star trek was one of those things i grew up i'm obviously the next generation era and next generation was a show that that like my dad watched it was like the adults show right and so we would see it sometimes and then obviously watched it a lot in reruns right and that was one of my big inspirations and the other one which i think makes me a little odd in north america is thunderbirds and thunderbirds is huge in england Yes. And it's huge in Japan, it's huge in Europe and huge in other places, but it never really got big in the States, it never really got big in Canada. But they re-ran it when I was a kid. And just the fact that every single thing on the frame was created. Like, you know, the rockets, the characters, the sets, the special effects, like the explosions, like nothing was just like they just took a camera and pointed it at something. Like I had to build shit and paint it and all that kind of stuff. So that my kid brain just was like totally <laughs> taken by that. It was just it like, was you know, shot very cinematically. Yes. Too. It was and like, that's the thing. It's like all these people, like the, the people who made those shows, all they wanted to do was make feature films. And that kind right. of makes it funny. It's like all they were sidled with these puppets, but they just desperately wanted to make these, you know, big stories and big budget adventures. And so they're trying to do that with the puppets and film them cinematically. And all that. So there's something kind of weird that came out of that. So, um, that was a big influence on me. And then as I grew up, I started learning just like we were talking about before we went on, um, after effects and mm -hmm. Photoshop and, um, and learning how to edit video. And so like, I, I was lucky that when I was really little, like I, I went to a film animation camp, which was a super cool, it's like a day camp. And right. me and my friends went and we shot on super eight and we like did stop frame with paper cutouts. So we would make all these characters and we'd do the, and we had a, 
um, a lovely um, instructor named Aiko Suzuki, who actually was the sister of David Suzuki, you know, the environmentalist. And um, she she was really hard on it. We were little kids and she was really hard on us. If we pitched her a story for this summer camp, she was like, that's not a story. She was like, come up with something better. <laughs> the, the, the characters have no motivation. And we're like, this is for like a three minute movie, right? This little short, like whatever. But she was so like, she was like, it needs to have a good, concise beginning middle and end so like she really like got us to wow. like focus the idea so we i had that experience and then um you know in, in high school i ran like the film festival and you know you do all those kinds of things right um and then uh i went to school for radio and television arts in toronto like a broadcasting film kind of thing that's actually where i met my wife Lindsay, okay uh who i run gazelle automations with we met in television school and uh, good place to go to find spouses interested it, in the same thing. Exactly, and it, and you know, honestly, we didn't we didn't connect until years after we graduated. That was a whole like we like you know drifted apart and then came back together kind of thing, which happens a lot, right? But um, but yeah, like and when I graduated from school, um, I thought I guess I should like I should get a proper industry job now that I have this degree, right? Like I was mm -hmm. I was I was actually um, teaching stop motion animation at the National Film Board of Canada during university. So there's another animation connection. So I was doing right. that. I, we had these, um, it was great. We had these kids come to us as young as like, you know, kindergarten and as old as university. And it would, every day was different. And sometimes it was morning and afternoon and we would do clay animation. We would do stop motion, um, uh, like, well, stop motion with clay. But that we'd also have them draw on 35 millimeter film, which was super cool. Like they had wow. even no idea what it was. So we'd lay out clear leader and it, we had little guides so you could see where all the frames were. And we'd say, everybody gets one second. So you all get 24 little pictures and you can do an animation of someone opening their umbrella or hair growing out of the head or someone running or whatever. And all these little kids would draw 24 little pictures that were almost the same. And then I would spool it into the projector, the 35 millimeter projector in the theater. And it was like a 79 seater movie theater where the curtain would open for these little kids and we would screen their claymation and their, their oh, drawing. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Man, and so they didn't forget that. No, like I, I had kids like I could see their brains exploding. Like when we would show them <laughs> this little dinosaur that you put on a skateboard, you know, that you animated running around the little set. And then I would show, <laughs> show them and it was moving all by itself. Their little heads would explode, you know. So very messy, very messy. Yes, very me very messy. Yeah. <laughs> but it's um it was uh it was a wonderful place to work. Um and I did that during university, but then after I graduated, I was like, I guess I should get like I, I wanted to work in the film industry. So I was like, I guess right. I should get like a even though I was at the film board, I was working in the kind of like yeah, the you know, this workshop environment. So I started at a editing company, like a post-production company that did film and TV and, and music videos and commercials. And I was an assistant is, editor. Did you okay. come in? Did you submit a resume, or was that something you knew someone, or did you go in as an uh, intern? You know, it's funny because I'm I'm someone a, a, a friend's daughter is asked. She's trying to get into the industry now, and she's asking me like how I did this, and I'm I'm relaying the story to her as well. <laughs> Sometimes I'm she's like in her twenties, and I was like I was telling her how like it is you. It's like a combination. You guys know this of like right place, right time, right. being ready. You know, having your portfolio together, all those kind of things. So. I was, I was, um, I was just out of school and I was thinking I should get a, like, I should get a job in the industry. And simultaneously at this post-production house, one of my friends that I'd gone to school with was now either a junior producer or an assistant editor or something. I think she was an assistant editor there and they were short staffed and they were so short staffed that one of the assistants was like, if you don't find someone to help me, I'm going to quit like tomorrow. So oh. the, 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 the owner's we're freaking out. And they, they said to, you know, my friend that I went to school with, like, who do you know, who knows how to pick things up quickly? Who do you know, who's like, you know, quick and whatever. And she was like, Justin, Justin, I went to school with a guy named Justin, she'd get him in. So it's like the lucky streak wow. for me was that I went to this job interview, they hadn't seen a reel, they hadn't seen like, any, I don't even know if I sent them a resume, like, I went into this, this job interview. And it, it was just like they were saying, when can you start? Like, because they were so desperate to get they're someone. They're sitting there waiting for the interview to get over. And they're like, mm, yeah, oh, oh, you did? That's great. You're done. Okay, come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's the, the editing <laughs> pages. Get, it, get in there, you know? So, like, I, I started, like, almost right away. 
and I was still teaching animation at the film board on the weekends. And then I was doing this, this job as an assistant editor. And of course, as this would happen, I'm at this editing company and the sister company is a visual effects company. And as soon as I started at the editing company, it was like, I went, that's where I want to work at, right. the, at the visual effects company. And so uh, my friend at the visual effects company, he, he says now, he, he remembers me poking my nose in all the time. <laughs> What's going, what, what are you guys doing? I'm like, do you need any help? Like, you know, he's like, oh, geez, what the, you know, just get out of here, right? But I did this from, for week after week after week. I just kept po poking my head in there. And so I lasted three months as an assistant editor, just three months. And they, all the owners could see it. They wanted, I, w I wanted to go to the, the, the visual effects company. So, <laughs> so an opening opened up there. It was a lateral move to, to become a tape operator. I don't even know if they have those anymore. Like I was like patching right. the bay and all that stuff labeling tapes i know people don't even use tapes anymore what and tapes? Um, exactly exactly I, rem I i mean part of my job was literally striping time code on tapes like you oh, load yeah. the tape and you oh, remember this dude, yeah I remember right. That. I right right oh. right right you matic beta cam all yeah. that fun stuff yeah this is uh oh, this is um uh beta cam s no beta cam sp, SP. SP yeah. and uh um did digicam uh digi digi beta oh, yeah. digi beta yeah so anyway, so they said, like, are you sure you want to do this? It's a lateral move. You're not going to get any more money. You're not going to advance in your career. I said, yes, absolutely. Yes. Let me move over. And then I just like, I know you like you guys do, like everybody in this industry does. You just go, I'm going to get as hella good at this as possible. I'm going to mm -hmm. put the labels on these tapes as best I possibly can. And every line yeah. is going to be straight. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, before you knew it, because it was a small company, which I think is also a great place for people to start out, um, they needed help on an animation project. And so they tried me out. And like, I already knew it, like, yeah. I definitely knew I had the skills to do this stuff. But this was like my first kind of foray into doing it really professionally. Right. And so I did that job. They were happy with the work. And then I was doing VFX work. I was doing After Effects. We did a job in Nuke. And then um, one of the flame artists, we had two flame artists at the studio and flame for people who don't know is like a, a, I guess they call it a high end compositing system right. or visual effects system. We had two flame artists and one of them left. So there was an opening. So the studio sent me to um, Los Angeles to get trained. So I went to LA Crazy. Wow. Yeah. and I got trained. It was like an in intensive one week course where just morning till night, I just did flame and I came back. And then the next thing you knew, I was doing like, you know, McDonald's commercials and whatever else, like all the, you know, the main kind of bigger jobs we were doing, I was doing all right. the finishing on it. So, and I did that for years. Uh, and that's kind of how I was doing kind of both animation work and wow. visual FX work. And um, that's, that's like that process of, of paying your dues. A lot of people, if you're getting mm -hmm. out of college, you're wondering, what am I going to do? I got this degree. I'm a director. Like most of the time, those degrees don't matter. Those are door openers for you. You need to consider your degree as a door opener. Yeah. And uh, in this case, it's something about always being being able, willing to do whatever it takes in order to be able to advance and always busting your butt to do it. Right. And there's that thing. It's like a law of attraction. And there are people like, oh, you just think about it and we'll come. I think there's a certain element of that because that's a goal and a focus. But there's also the a law of a Alignment that is often mis overlooked and that's saying preparing yourself to be ready when those doors open and it's like if you're a, a guy that's sitting in the basement of your mom's house and you're you know 400 pounds and you're playing video games all day and you want to marry a supermodel like no matter how hard you think about marrying a supermodel you're not getting a supermodel <laughs> unless you elevate yourself to like you hit the gym you start working out you get a good job maybe you get some stuff done and maybe then when that right person comes you create it so i think it's great is that you were that's that is that active go-getter mentality it's not somebody who looking for something to happen to them it's someone who's yeah. happening happening to their, yeah, environment, their environment to their life right. that's yeah. how just that's how justin's doing this because he's he's got a very clear goal and he knows where he wants to go and he's actively pursuing it on a regular basis that is is a successful person no matter how far well, not, Justin i don't know not yet but, but, but yeah no, because <laughs> I think no matter no matter where you are in your career in mm -hmm. your journey it's like you are actively pursuing a worthwhile goal and you're yes. taking the steps towards it and you're continuing to do it and you've already demonstrated those path in order to achieve that success now it's just as those moments open and those doors open and even something like this with your star trek yeah. or even you did thunderbirds right you did yeah. a new pup well, i even talk, talk about, about yeah well i i have to remember one thing that um a, a friend coworker told me at the very last vi visual effects place i worked because i worked in several different studios over the years and he said he actually went to school with me same place same he was in the same year as my wife and he said he he worked in the um equipment lockup you know where people would rent 
like go to like borrow the right. cameras and the tripods, or whatever. And he remembers specifically that one of the students, one of the you know people in our program, came and was really rude to him when he was in, at, working at the equipment lockup. Now my coworker friend um, is uh, you know in a position of hiring, you know at the studio I was working at, and he saw the name of that person who was rude to him come into on, on one of the resumes, and he was just like, nope, nope. <laughs> You know, and, and it, it, what it made me think is like, yeah, remember at any given point, you be nice to people. To, exactly. Right. Just be, be, be kind, you know, cause like, and, and that's, I think also part of why I got my start as an assistant editor is because my friend at that company remembered that I was, you know, friendly and helpful and trying to, you know, look out for people. And, and, you know, if someone had a, a, a project they wanted me to help them shoot or edit or something, I would usually help them out. So you know, it's, it really does count to, and definitely don't be an asshole to people just, you know, yeah. cause you never, yeah, exactly. You yeah, never know yeah. when <laughs> <laughs> you never, you never yeah. know when it's gonna, when it's going, who you're gonna, you know, and that person might be the person who's hiring, you know, uh, my friend was just like, he was working at the, the equipment lockup. He was just like a guy who worked there. He wasn't anybody at that point or anybody that kind of, you know, we were all students. Right. But, um, you just never know. Never. Yeah. So yeah, the Thunderbirds thing, my wife and I went to, we, were, we weren't married at the time, but we went to England and we made three new episodes of Thunderbirds, um, like 1960s Thunderbirds. Because I know there was also the show that Weta made, you know, Weta, like Lord of the Rings Weta, they made a new cartoon um, and that was done with CG and um, it was, it was, uh, it was, I think it came out 2015, but we were doing three new episodes 1960 style so everything was done as if it was like 1965 th this whatever. is because there were some i guess audio recordings or 30 33 so, yeah uh, so it was there, small there was, lps that exactly were, yeah so we yeah like and it was the 50th anniversary of the show okay and we had just i actually had done the post-production on a documentary all about that studio and if anyone's fascinated by that's like you want to see like a really quirky story about a film studio um check out filmed in super marionation so that's i i did all the 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 design i was like the art director on it and i also did all the post-production and that film did really well like we got good reviews it had a cinema release it's i think it's still playing on tv and uh, like we i think i was surprised by how well it was received but i but the story was really well told and that was down to the um director and the editor or whatever so we we had a little bit of cachet and then this 50th anniversary thing came about and I think because we'd had a good result with the documentary, I had this idea to pitch to ITV. What if we take those? Um, I think it was my idea. It might have been my my uh, the, the other director's idea. One of us came up with this. We were in a car together. One of us came up with this. And um, and it was like we had those th those. There were records that came out in the '60s for little kids that had the voice actors from the '60s, no picture. And so I was like, well, it's going to sound authentic for right. sure. Let's just do the picture for it. You know. Let's get some puppets. Let's build some sets. Let's whatever. So, so we did, and um, and those are now on BritBox. They're not available, I think, anywhere except for the UK. But if you're in the UK, you can watch it on BritBox, and they're right next to the uh, the original Thunderbirds, like the actual wow. original. So it's all part of one big pantheon <laughs> now, which is kind of cool. Um, can you tell the difference? That most people can't. Or? So the greatest thing people said to to us was that they couldn't spot the join, and I, I I'm sure that you know, it's, we, we couldn't get a hundred percent perfect. Like nobody can, right? Like when you watch right. like the force awakens and you look at the millennium Falcon set and you look at the millennium Falcon set in the original star Wars, I'm sure if you really stare at it, you could see that's not quite the same, but if the impression is there, um, and that's actually something that influenced even the star Trek filmation thing is like, this is an exercise in legitimately recreating a look, a feel, a vibe, you know, visually. And, um, and that was something we had to do with Thunderbirds. We had to like light it the same way. We had to, um, we shot some of it on film. And uh, you know, there was one film lab in, in England that was still open. And I actually remember, I, I can say this now, that we went to their film lab and there were a bunch of reels sitting on a table. And I think those were Rogue One. Rogue One? No, Rogue One was shot digitally. Which, which movie was it that shot on film? It was one of the Star Wars films, but it was one of the Star Wars right. films that was sitting there because they processed it because they were the one studio that was still, I remember going in and there was like a guy, one guy in a lab coat in this, like the bath, you know, where they, they're processing the film. Right. 
And I was like, what happens if this guy like, you know, catches a cold or, or <laughs> kicks the bucket? Like who's going to take over for this one guy in a lab coat, you know, like it's like the one guy left. Right. Anyway. Um, wow. So, yeah, so that was a really interesting experience. And also just kind of, I was spoiled because again, in North America, these puppets aren't a big deal, but we took the puppets to like the BBC one show, which is like a big deal over there. And like good morning Britain and stuff. And right. people went insane for them. Like it was like seeing the Muppets or seeing a celebrity. Like we just brought these puppets and the people would devolve into children and they were like, Oh my God, let's get a picture with, you know, anyway. So it was, <laughs> that's wow. awesome. Yeah. It's like, I play... think... Oh, go ahead, Jason. No, I was going to say nostalgia is really huge right now. I think yeah. a lot of people are kind of doing that look back to those things when they were, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's perfect time for it. Yeah. Mm. So, did, did that play into the Doctor Who at all? Since that is British as well, or you, I so I did work on Doctor Who as well. I, I honestly forgot that I did that. <laughs> that so I've I've worked on two Doctor Who stories, and I feel like I sh oh geez I shouldn't say this. I'm not as familiar with Doctor Who, not as right. familiar, but <gasps> yeah, and I, and I know, but 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 if 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 that there aren't big enough, <gasps> if, if, there, if there are any Doctor Who fans out there, just know that. I definitely put the research in. And I think that's very important, right. you know? Um, no matter what it is you're doing, if you have to recreate a vibe or, you know, complex, because like the big, um, for Doctor Who, the big um, ask that they the BBC uh, wanted was they were like, it's an episode from the 70s, one of them. And the other one was, a, was one from the 80s. And they were like, we want the visual effects, the new ones that you do to complement what's there. We don't want it to feel like it's just pasted on top. So right. we did research about what technologies were available in the 70s and the 80s, like optical technology, video technology. Um, and I redid all the, um, the model shots of the ships, but I made them look like models because that's what they would have been, you know? But like, but like really, if they had models with a lot of money, because right. like Doctor Who models, sorry, it didn't look very good. <laughs> like the models were fine, but like the way they shot them was terrible, right? Like, yeah, they, yeah. you know. Lighting so, was not, not very, right. it was flat, very flat. Ex exactly. And they were, they were shooting them like with video cameras, which, yeah. mm, you know, video, and you know, if they wanted the ship to fly by the camera, they had the camera on like a, like a little dolly. floor dolly thing. Dolly. And they were just pushing it by the thing. And that's not quite the same as doing motion control. So I thought of really? it as like, <laughs> what if they had, what if they had motion control? What if they had the technology that like, is it, this would have been, 1979 is when that first episode I did was okay. was from and I was like well Star Wars came out 77 Empire came out 80 so they would have had motion control they would have they, like, they, those kinds of things so I just did it like that I was like imagine they had that much money on Doctor Who which I still think fits into the era but it doesn't look nearly as if you'll pardon me for saying so janky as as the <laughs> original shots looked you know I I remember showing Lindsay what that doctor who episode looked like before i started working on it and it was like one shot of the ship flying by the camera and she was like laughing so hard tears were going down her face so. it's like to me it's like those indian movies you know where they do superman and it's yeah just, yeah oh like yes. this, yeah they yeah. Turn it yeah. Sideways. yeah you can see through <laughs> the uniform you can yeah. see yeah. the uniform yeah. the holes yeah. <laughs> yep yep <laughs> and it's like oh. hey it told the story and people yeah. loved it but yeah and again like yeah. going back to the the star trek animated series i think again it is similar it's like doctor who you can watch it inside the story and you can just say i'm just going to take this straight you know we even did that watching the original star trek is like when shatner right. is walking around the set you can hear the wood creaking on the set so either you're like yeah he's walking on a set or you just suspend your disbelief and go yeah he's on a spaceship like why not right so yeah. you, it's, you, there's two ways of watching something so like that doctor who stuff definitely i know a lot of fans out there can suspend disbelief and do spend suspend disbelief but hopefully when they watch the stuff that I worked on. And I, I, my friend, Chris Cassell, who is another VFX artist, we teamed up for the first one. And then I did most of the work on the second one, but we hope that people will kind of embrace it. <sighs> We're out of time. That was the first half of our interview with Justin T. Lee, visual effects artist extraordinaire. And next week, we're going to talk more about an in-depth look into the Filmation Next Generation episode that he did. So you want to stick around for that. It's going to be pretty fun. 
You know how we know it's going to be fun? Because we've already shot it. We've already shot it. <laughs> we already know what's in it. And we and you're know what's like coming it. up. And we've already seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I think part two is actually better than part one. Yeah, so, it's, uh, it's pretty darn cool. So check around. it out. Coming up next week on Entertainment Dude.